Hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, I hope everybody can see my camera. Let me just check here. I think there's some um, technical issues. Let me see what I can do here. Um, all right. Um, all right. Hopefully, it's working now. Uh, so I'm here with my colleague, Yura, who's going to be helping us uh, go through the presentation today about generative AI and summaries and how that might impact the regulatory analyst, analyst or the regulatory analysis world. Um, so I'm going to switch over to the computer here and just bring up the slideshow. Uh, the slides and the presentation will be shared after the uh, webinar. So if you're registered today, if you're here today, you will get a copy of this by email tomorrow. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. I think we'll probably need about half an hour to go through the presentation today, which will leave us plenty of time for questions. Um, and please post your questions into the questions panel on the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side in the GoToWebinar system, there's a questions panel, and you can type your questions in there, and then we will go through them towards the end of the of the meeting um let me uh, stop my webcam so for whatever reason this is really odd um where is uh, that's particularly odd okay <laughs> um uh, so please put your questions into the panel um, and we'll get them to the end i'm going to start today by just launching a little poll to see who um is on the call today who in the sense of have you used generative AI in the past? Um, or, you know, have you played around with ChatGPT or with uh, some other AI that maybe generates images or video? There's so many tools out there. Kind of curious to know how many people have been using this technology, whether it's in a professional context or in a personal one. Uh, just keen to see how many people have tried this so far. So I'll let everybody respond to the poll. I think we have 80, almost 85% responded. So I will um, close the poll now and share the results. So it looks like about 61% of people have not used generative AI, which uh, is actually a little bit surprising. I, even my mother has used uh, chat GPT. Um, so uh, so it's, it's definitely a huge technology, but it's good to know that about 61% have not used it and 39% um, have. And then my last question before we jump into this is, what is your impression, for those of you who have used uh, generative AI, or even those who have maybe not used it, but you've heard about it, what's your general impression of the technology? Is it something that you regard positively, meaning you think it's gonna bring benefits to society, to businesses, to people, something that maybe you feel a little bit negative about, a little bit worried that it's going to have some negative consequences, or perhaps you're just you're just not sure yet. It's a pretty new technology. Um, so we're kind of keen to see where people stand in terms of their impression of generative AI. All right, we'll give a couple more seconds for people to uh, respond. And um, we'll click on um, close. All right, so... 53%, let me share the results, 53% uh, view the um, view it positively, and uh, about 30% are unsure, 9% are negative. So it seems most people are positive, but then there's a lot of kind of unsure. So let me uh, hide this poll. All right, great. So I'm gonna just share my screen and everybody should see some sli a slide on um, your screen. <laughs> and I apologize today, I'm a little bit I have a little bit of a cold, so my voice is a little bit more congested than normal. So bear with me, but uh, we're here, you're here to help me. So generative AI for regulatory analysis. That's the topic for today's discussion. Um, and we'll give you just a, a very brief interview about, not interview, a brief inter introduction about mnemonic. We'll talk about generative AI it's, as a concept and a technology. And then how are we using this at Mnemonic um, and how is this impacting regulatory analysis? All right, so very briefly about Mnemonic. Um, many of you are probably already familiar with us, but we're established in Montreal in 2008. We have offices in Calgary, Toronto, and Shanghai. Uh, we recently acquired a couple of companies, one in Toronto, one in uh, Calgary. 
We service about 700 customers around the world, and we focus particularly on mid-sized companies that have multiple locations, meaning you're in multiple jurisdictions, multiple regulatory frameworks apply to you. Those are the companies that we uh, work most with. Um, so Mnemonic, briefly, is we offer an integrated compliance management solution. So we're trying to pull together the regulations, the industrial standards, and the internal requirements that your organization has given itself and provide you a tool to manage all this information and gain peace of mind that you have a robust compliance framework in place. Um, and we're helping companies move from this reactive side to the proactive side uh, in terms of their compliance management. And part of this journey is providing our customers with information that helps them determine if a regulation or if a set of requirements applies to them. I think one of the biggest challenges that companies have uh, once they start on their compliance journey is they can get overwhelmed with information. There's just in Ontario, Canada, one province, there's about 3,500 in force regulations, regulations that are currently in force, 3,500. Uh, so you can imagine multiplying that across multiple jurisdictions, multiple countries. Uh, it's a lot of data that you have to weed through. And so that's where the AI comes in handy. Because um, most companies are still surprised by regulatory change or by regulatory requirements, and these surprises inevitably lead to costs. Even if you don't get a fine or a penalty, you still have to deal with the headache of trying to solve a problem. Um, so helping you find the relevant information is, is really what mnemonic is all about, all about. And change is happening more and more often. So there's about three times more change per year than there used to be. And most regulatory compliance teams have not grown in size or really changed their practices fundamentally. So you have all this additional work that's being thrown at you, um, but not necessarily more resources. And again, that's where generative AI uh, can play a big role because it can do a lot of the work that, say, a junior regulatory anal analyst would be doing for you. And at Mnemonic, our focus is on prevention. So we want to help you prevent problems before they occur. And just, I know I'm repeating myself, but a big part of prevention is knowing what's coming down the pipeline and whether or not it applies to you. And that's what we'll talk about a bit today. Because the goal at the end of the day is to make your organization more resilient. And that, that means having all your requirements in one place, having them organized and mapped to your organization, always being ready for an audit, and ultimately increasing trust and having fewer surprises. And one of the main barriers or hurdles that we've seen when it comes to identifying requirements is really figuring out what does a document, like a specific regulation, what does this document regulate? What's, what is it trying to regulate? How does it do it? And who does it apply to? And so be helping our customers answer these questions of what, how, and who uh, is absolutely critical. And that's really a big hurdle because with thousands and thousands of regulations and all these changes happening, you want to be able to answer these questions quickly, uh, clearly, and provide that information to the relevant person at the right time. Um, so this is where we are using generative AI to, uh, to help move the needle forward. Because the traditional approaches for solving this problem of like, does this regulation apply to me? What do I have to do? Uh, the general approaches are doing it in-house, but that's very time consuming and a distraction from your core business often. Hiring consultants, which can be very good. Consultants have that deep industry knowledge, but often there's a high cost to that. And consultants will be inconsistent, meaning some consultants do it this way, other consultants do it a different way. Um, and then if you're talking about doing it across the whole organization, not just EHS, but HR, cybersecurity, privacy, Consultants are all working in different ways, so that can be just very expensive and very inconsistent. And then you can try and do this through enterprise software, you know, by SAP, by Intellex, and then try and pull data into it, but that is very expensive and very complex. So what we try to do with our customers is go through all these different areas and say, okay, what are the compliance areas you want to focus on? And Mnemonic does much more than EHS. We cover cybersecurity regulations, privacy, industrial relations, public safety. Um, and so more and more companies are moving away from a siloed compliance approach to one where everything's centralized. But to make that work, you know, the reason we have siloed compliance approaches and different solutions for environment, safety, cybersecurity, is because very often the companies that offer those solutions have an expertise in understanding the requirements 
in a given domain. But with this generative AI, a lot of that expertise can now be automated through AI. And so we think it's more relevant than ever to try and implement a solution across the board that allows you to have a standardized approach to compliance and leverage that AI to get the analysis that you need to understand how does this regulation apply to me or does it apply to me? If so, how and what do I have to do to stay in compliance? Um, and so that's it. The challenge that I've seen of many organizations, they have this decentralized approach and they delegate the work of compliance to various parts of the business, but each part of the business inevitably takes its own approach with varying results. And it makes it very difficult to tell the board or tell management or tell investors, yes, we're compliant across the board or we're on, an, on the path to compliance across the board because environment will give them data in one format and HR will give them data in a completely different format and some other department may have no system in place. So you want to centralize this. So generative AI, let me just take a sip of water. So we've talked already about generative AI and I've alluded to it, we've had a couple of poll questions, but let's give it a definition. So the definition that I like is that generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is a broad term that includes many different things. Generative AI is one specific type that creates unique or original content automatically. This can be text, it can be video, it can be images. Um, and modern generative, modern generative AI uses machine learning and is trained on large amounts of data. Often in the text area, it'll be called large language models. So when you talk about ChatGPT, that is a generative AI tool that is primarily focused on text. There are other tools that there are images, some are on um, software uh, development, and there is a random component to it. Um, so even if you give it the same input, meaning you ask it the same question, you're not always going to get the same answer. And so in many ways, this emulates humans, right? You ask the same person the same question on three different days, same person, same question, you're gonna, you might not get exactly the same answer, especially if it's a more complex answer. So generative AI, in a certain sense, emulates the way humans provide, produce content and uh, provide answers. And I, I really like this quote from the author Douglas Adams about technology. What is technology? And, and his quote here is that anything that is in the world when we're born, we just consider that normal. So whether it's a car, I think everybody on the call here was born after cars were invented. Many of us don't think of cars as technology. They're just part of the world. Anything that's invented between your 15 and your 35 is new and exciting. Uh, for, so for some people, that'll be chat GPT or generative AI. Uh, so for some of us, it was like the iPhone or laptop computers or the internet. And then everything that's invented after your 35 is against the natural order of things. So I think we've seen that reaction a little bit to generative AI, where some people have said, whoa, this is, you know, there's errors in this technology. It's not giving me the correct answer, or it's, it sounds like it's the correct answer, but it's it's misleading. Um, and so I think, I'm not saying that's only the people over 35, but there's maybe a tendency to have a little bit more doubt there. Um, and so what we do at Mnemonic is, is we uh, identify the physical operations for our customers, then we try and identify the requirements and the action, the audits that need to be taken. Um, and so there's this little workflow diagram on the right-hand side that I really liked, uh, which was asking the question of, is it safe to use chat GPT for your task. And so it says, you know, does it matter if the output is true? So if it doesn't matter if the output is true, then yeah, sure, use it, there's no risk. But if it matters that it's true, and in Mnemonic's case, of course it matters that our regulatory analysis is true, you need to ask the question, do you have the expertise to verify that the output is accurate? And if you don't, you should not use chat GPT. But if you have the, ver the capacity to verify that it's accurate, uh, then you can use ChatGPT and just make sure you verify accuracy and you have a quality control process. And so that's very much the philosophy that we've taken at Mnemonic. We have a team of regulatory analysts that have been working in this area for years and we're using them and their expertise to validate what the generative AI is producing. 
And through that iterative process, we make the output better and better. I want to share some examples with you today. Um, so just a few slides on the advancements in artificial intelligence, because I think when you take a bit of a broader perspective, you can see that we've come a long way, but it's taken a bit of time. And so this chart here, which actually ends in 2020 or 2021, shows that things like image recognition, speech recognition took 20 years to get where we are today. It started in maybe the early, late 90s, uh, but only recently in the last few years have some of these technologies outperformed humans, um, which is ultimately the goal. We want these technologies to do things better than humans would. If we go back to thinking about a calculator, uh, you know, you had the abacus and you had very primitive calculators, but then once we got into electronic calculators, uh, they were clearly much better than humans at doing uh, calculation. And so some of the technology today uh, is better than humans on many fronts. Um, and that's why we're seeing this, this huge shift in industry. But there's been all these evolutions. So AI is not a new concept. Um, it's as soon as we started building computers, we started talking about the theoretically computers being smarter than humans. And I think many of us, myself included as an engineer, kind of doubted that that would ever be possible. But in the last five years, we've seen such tremendous progress that uh, we really are starting to ask ourselves questions about where they'll be. So these are just some big markers um, in the journey to artificial intelligence. Um, but of course, there's, there's many, many, many steps and people and, and papers that are involved. And this is something I, I like to, it's a meme from uh, Elon Musk, but I, I saw this the other day. I was like, wow, that's powerful. So 2006, if we think back to 2006, the iPhone had just been released and Facebook had just started. Um, and 2040, which is not that far away, uh, is just as far back as 2006. So, so if we think of where generative AI and artificial intelligence is today in 2023, and think about how far we've come from 2006 when it comes to like iPhones and mobile technology, um, we're gonna have huge changes between now and 2040. Um, and when things start to change, technologies, it can happen very quickly. So some of these charts here, just show you the advancement technology where something was like kind of plodding along, but at a certain point, there's an inflection where the cost of the new technology is so vastly superior to the previous technology that it just completely replaces it in a very quick time span. So here we're comparing like steam to electricity, um, where around 20, 1935, it inverted and steam power basically disappeared and electricity took over. Same thing for gas uh, versus electricity for, for lighting. Um, uh, cast iron to steel, sailing ships to steamships, horses and cars. So at a certain point, there's a crossover and things can move very quickly afterwards. And I do think we're in that phase now for many information management type work. Um, and once these changes happen, they scale up very quickly, and then they tend to plateau. Um, and I think we're going to see that to a certain extent in, in with the AI. And that would maybe be a longer discussion, but things do scale up very quickly, and then they tend to plateau in terms of uh, the infrastructure and, and the scalability of it. Um, and over the last 40 years or so, since 1982, the number of jobs or the percentage of employment in the economy that has been management and professional related has grown much faster uh, than other areas of employment. Um, and I think this is gonna come under a lot of pressure with the generative AI. We're, today we're talking about regulatory analysis, but I think this applies to many, many data management uh, positions. Um, and so the, the, the threat for AI uh, is, is a lot for bachelor people with a bachelor degrees and graduate or professional degrees. Um, and this is going to be very different than the previous automations we had that affected factory workers with robotics, uh, automated shipping containers, things of that nature. So this new technological revolution is going to have a big impact on those white collar workers, uh, ourselves included. Um, and so a few things with the generative AI. Um, a lot of it is built on open source libraries and systems that are widely available. So almost any company can get this up and running pretty quickly. We do think in mnemonic that a lot of the regulatory analyst job will be automated in the coming years. 
Um, and there's not, for companies that offer regulatory analysis, whether it's mnemonic or others, there's not a lot of protection around this because the libraries are freely available, because it's easy to scale up. Um, what, you know, what we're trying to do at Mnemonic is offer you a complete package with workflows, tools, and reporting so that you're not just using our regulatory information, but you're really leveraging it and linking it back to your physical business operations. All right, that's a bit about generative AI and some technological changes. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how we're using AI at Mnemonic and some concrete examples. So we collect about 2,000 to 3,000 new regulatory documents uh, per month. Some months is even higher than that. Um, and the number of new documents is constantly um, uh, constantly uh, evolving. So let me just close this. Uh, and, and so as we're increasing the scope, because we've increased the scope from environment to health and safety to public safety to HR, and we've increased the scope geographically. So we started with just Canada, then we had the US, Europe, and we're up to 30 countries and 600, 600 jurisdictions. Um, and so we're really leveraging these AI tools to become more and more efficient while ensuring quality and rapid delivery of content. So how are we using, mnemonic, how are we using AI at Mnemonic? Uh, there's a few different ways. One is we're generating summaries of the regulatory documents. Um, and we've been working on this for a couple of years, tested different things, and we're using some technologies that are specific to summarizing legal documents that are quite superior to, say, ChatGPT. But we'll share some examples today. Um, we also try to identify the obligations or requirements within these documents. So a big question from a lot of our customers, okay, this document definitely applies to me, but it's 200 pages long and it has 700 provisions. Which provisions do I need to pay attention to? And that's the question we're trying to answer with the identification of obligations. And then um, detection of relevance. So companies wanna know which documents apply to me um and does it apply to me based on my business activities based on my industry based on my location and that's uh another way that we're using ai to so try and categorize the documents based on industry geography subject area things of that nature so let's show you a few examples here and i recognize that it might be a little bit difficult to read some of this text so we're going to go through it quickly today um but uh the presentation will be made available to everybody you'll receive it by email um, and, and, and these are some concrete examples, and we always link back to the source document. So this, this uh, example was um, prepared uh, by Yura, so maybe I'll let Yura talk about it a little bit. Uh, he's been working on the AI team for, for a while now. Yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, as Jonathan said, you will have the opportunity to see in more detail the examples and compare the results. But basically, the idea for us uh, is to give you a general overview of uh, like practical practical points here, which we have encountered already. So basically, as you see, there is a John GPT example uh, for summary uh, of one document: it's energy conservation equipment regulations for Canada. And uh, but if you input to really like a link to John GPT, you will not receive a meaningful result. It will give you something, yeah, but most likely it will be some uh, irrelevant document uh, because uh, currently, uh, as of today, at least ChatGPT is not really able to process the links. So only solution for you to do the summary with ChatGPT is basically to copy and paste the full text of the document and receive the summary. Yeah, but uh, the solution that we use, it allows us to just make it more simple and uh, just input the link and receive the summary you see the result on the slide so basically we can continue yeah the second slide it's also some canadian regulation you will see the link and you can check it uh, but basically uh, the point of this slide and example is that uh, even you are doing with chat gpt like you are copying the text and inputting to it to receive the summary uh, it's not always possible because uh, okay, uh, also as of today, ChatGPT has its own limitations on uh, the volume of text that you can uh, input to it. Yep. Uh, so uh, for a large
large document of I don't know, 200 pages or plus, uh, you won't receive a summary and you will have to do, uh, I don't know, by parts or something. Uh, there are other solutions like chat PDF that uh, basically allows you to uh, make a document as PDF, upload to the website and uh, receive uh, some summary, but it uh, takes a lot of extra steps. Uh, so, and what uh, the solutions that we use uh, currently, it, uh, yeah, it uh, basically, it has also some limitations on volume of documents, on information that we can input, but they're quite high and basically they cover majority of the documents that we have. Yeah, so we can continue. Sure. So uh, I'll answer a couple of questions as we're going through this. Um, uh, and just to reemphasize what Yura has talked about, so a lot of the commercial tools that are out there, you have limitations on the size of the document or things like ChatGPT, they don't have the current internet or current access to the internet. And so uh, if a new regulation comes out or if a regulation has been amended, uh, it's not necessarily working on the right version. So that's where we at Mnemonic have developed some tools to allow us to use the most current version of the regulation, use the full text of the regulation with no limit on the number of characters. Uh, there was a question about like, what prompt or what question do we feed into ChatGPT or into other generative AI tools? The tools that we're showing here are tools that have been developed specifically for summarization. So ChatGPT is a more general tool. You can ask all sorts of questions. I, I asked it to write a birthday card for my wife <laughs> and, and then I asked it to evolve and like write the card in the style of Ernest Hemingway. So it can do many different things, uh, but there are some amazing AI tools out there that are more specific to specific needs. So in this case, summaries, I will show you some examples of other things, but uh, um, so depending on what you're looking to do, there's different tools out there and, and that's what Mnemonic has been uh, working on. So it, there's no specific question in, um, in the solution that we're using because it is a question. The question is basically, please summarize this document and highlight the, the key most important elements. All right, let's go to the next one here. Yeah, the next example is basically focused on uh, not the input, uh, what you are inputting to the, what you're asking uh, the generative UI, or uh, what uh, basically there is some limitations. It's basically what uh, AI produces for you when you input it something. Yeah, there are some problems with it. Uh, so basically, uh, and uh, as you see, um, Sometimes uh, summarizers can pick some irrelevant information. They can do irrelevant uh, technical information included to the summary, or they may omit some information and in this way mislead you. So as Jonathan previously mentioned, you have to verify the accuracy of the information. Uh, but yeah, and, but the point is that we have like very good result at this point of time. Yeah, and what will be in the future is just uh, probably we cannot imagine. Yeah, so we're, we're, as we're going through our quality control and feedback, and we'll show you some feedback we've received from customers and from industry experts, uh, we're adjusting the parameters in the AI models, and we're trying to get it to give us a summary that we feel is most relevant for our customers. Now, we're not writing summaries for lawyers, we're writing summaries for operators of businesses, usually manufacturing and industrial companies. Um, but here, Eura has shown that often summarize will pick up on information that is interesting, but not necessarily relevant for our customers. Um, you know, administrative information on when the, the regulation was produced and things like that. Also, it sometimes includes some technical information or references that just aren't that relevant. Um, and, then, and then sometimes the summarizer won't will be a little bit too verbose. You know, it, it, so we provide some inputs and then adjust it and the adjusted summary that we're aiming for is this one on the bottom right hand side, which is, is shorter um, and, and really highlights the key, the key information we want to share with our customers. Yeah, so this is also an example with uh, input or uh, output provided by the AI. And in this case, uh, for very large documents, uh, actually what we have experienced, uh, sometimes summarizers pick some provisions that summarizers based uh, on its algorithm decides that they are most important or most interesting. 
but uh, the point is for like for personal development and basically is uh, to pick uh, the most uh, relevant provisions for customers here yeah, for businesses and we are working also in this direction and so far uh, we can like summarize that it's the most notable provisions that should be included to in the summaries yeah yeah it's all about in our case it's, it's modifying the summarizers the technology to provide a summary that is useful for our customers and again we're, we're, we're servicing a specific type of person a specific type of customer um, and that's where we're trying to gain feedback from our own staff plus our customers and industry experts um, so this example is uh, regulation again in, in Canada or in Quebec um, and, and so I left in red the specific comments from an industry expert so this is somebody who's been working in the field doing EHS consulting for 35 years in Quebec. So they know these regulations forwards and backwards and upsides and down. And um, I, I provided our summary from the AI tool and then they highlighted certain things in yellow and they um, highlighted them in red or left some notes in red, I should say. So they, you know, they pointed out here that the AI tool maybe didn't emphasize exactly the highest ranked items that they that a consultant would, but they say it is still quite good, um, and uh, and that you know it omitted things like risk assessment um, and uh, made a little bit more too too much emphasis on fall protection and not enough on machine safety. So my point of showing this example is that. You know the summary was pretty good <laughs> um and and if you compare this to something that you would have a human right uh to get a human to write something better than this would take decades of experience um and and the summarizer can do it in a few seconds with um minimal cost so we're already at a very advanced stage um and this is similarly another regulation um and here he's making some comments about you know, the formatting it's saying it it addresses the regulation also addresses specific industries whereas you could just say it applies to everybody including these types of industries there's a bit of repetition um and then you know they'd state some obvious things like monetary administrative penalties may be imposed which is kind of a given um and again highlight some things that if a human were writing it maybe it would have omitted but that's where we're going through this iterative process but the, the point here is again, this is these are comments coming from an industry expert um, based on something that's coming out of an automated AI tool. It's pretty remarkable, if you ask me. <laughs> um, so, so you know, there's still challenges. I don't want to give the impression that this is a completely solved problem, but um, we've made insane progress in the last few years. Um, some of the challenges is is when the data, the underlying is data, is in different formats or different types of data that can create some problems for the uh, the ai um, there are some limitations to the amount of data so like chat gpt has a character limit i think i forget what it is but maybe it's like a few thousand characters but regulations can often be hundreds of thousands millions of characters or, or words i think some u.s regulations are you know just thousands of pages it's crazy um, and then the, the data that comes out of the AI, sometimes the format and the structure is not exactly how you would want it to be. So you need to then manipulate it afterwards. Um, but those are some of the challenges. I don't know, Yura, if you've seen some other challenges that you want to share with the uh, with, with the users. main ones, yeah. So, far, yeah. Um, so that's it. We had a short presentation today. We just wanted to share some of our results and thoughts and, and issues we've seen with generative AI in the regulatory analysis space. But please pop in some questions and um, we'll go through those. Um, so we answered the first few. So how do you, uh, those are, well, right, let's go through these in order. Um, so how do you, from Cedric, he's asking, how do you identify regulatory changes? Your mnemonic solution is good for explanation of the regs. So what we've shown today is really the summaries of the regulations and extracting some of the obligations. As for identifying the changes, that we have not yet really automated or fully automated. It depends on the jurisdiction uh, because each jurisdiction operates differently, 
different regulatory structures, different publication streams. So a lot of that is still manual. Um, so the AI hasn't really helped on that front, but we have a team that basically monitors the questions. Um, so a tip here from Jeffrey, he says, it's not a question, but a friendly tip. Um, those of you who are, have, who are maybe nervous about using ChatGPT, try having a conversation with Microsoft's Bing AI chat. Um, it only allows 20 user inputs per session, like the old tried and tested 20 questions. It's kind of fun. So yeah, I think uh, Microsoft Bing has, they financed a lot of ChatGPT, and so they've integrated some of the ChatGPT stuff into Microsoft Bing. So if you want to just test out it, go and ask it some questions. Um, I even had my wife, who's a tax lawyer, she asked it some questions about tax law, uh, and she said the answers were pretty good. Again, not perfect, but pretty good. Um, so how do I uh, try with that? So please feel free to pop in any questions, or if you have some experiences with generative AI tools, good or bad, we're certainly keen to hear from you as, as, um, as well. So one question from Daniel is, uh, are, uh, how does this work with foreign language, uh, non-English, I guess, uh, text? Uh, it works quite well, actually. The, 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 uh, the, the examples I showed you here, the clean air regulation and the, um, sorry, the clean air regulation and the occupational health and safety regulation in Quebec, I actually fed those into our tool in French. Um, and uh, the output is in English, but the input was in French and uh, it was very good. Um, other languages, it struggles a bit more. We've tested it a bit with um, a Chinese text because we have a lot of Chinese customers. And there, there was also a bit, been a bit more, uh, a, bit, a few more issues, but it's still generally very good. And again, the thing to remember here is this is not uh, something where they're done. You know, it's getting better every day, every week. And so the foreign language issue is something that frankly, I think is, is on its way to being solved in the next little while. Um, and we're already using it on non-English text um, in certain jurisdictions. Great, thank you so much for all the questions. Um, if anybody else has any other questions, uh, please feel free to uh, pop those into the, uh, into, the, into the question panel here. We'll give everybody a couple more minutes to pop those in. There's also, I think, a satisfaction survey when you exit the webinar. Just give us feedback on this survey, uh, sorry, on this webinar. And uh, if you'd like any sort of follow-up conversation with, with the mnemonic staff, please fill in that, um, please fill in that, that survey. Um, and I think we have a, ha a handout as well. If you want to download a copy of the slides, you can download those in the handout section. So here's a question from Samson. He's saying, um, so in our experience, you require a human subject matter expert to review and approve the results generated by AI. Does this mean that there's, in the short term, the human needs to be fully versed in regulations? Otherwise, the SME may not be able to accurately filter the AI generated results. That's a good question. So I think Samson's asking, you know, who needs to be doing this quality control and how much expertise do they need to have? What we've done in Mnemonic is to kind of take a look at the summaries and there's two things you want to look for. I mean, you want to look for is the th are the things that the summary is saying true? And that you can usually verify by just going back to the regulation and trying to find the relevant text and make sure it's in the original regulation. But then the bigger challenge is, does the summary leave out important information that should otherwise be included? Um, and that, that's a question that's a little bit harder to answer because theoretically you would have to go through the whole regulation, master it, to be able to answer that question. So we, we kind of approximate that where we have a structured template that we want the summaries to follow. Like we want them to say this, this, and this. Um, and if it's missing a specific piece of information, we then go and try and fill it in and feed that information back into the AI so that it gets better over time. Um, so the short answer is, you know, I don't think you need a, somebody who's an expert on, on the regulation to validate it, but you need somebody who has some critical thinking and the ability to go and, and do fact checking, kind of like a fact checker 
uh, for uh, a media outlet. You know, you would go and fact check it, um, but you're not necessarily going to go check if the story itself has covered every last possible angle. Uh, and there's nobody out there who's an expert in every regulation. So to make this cost effective, we kind of use a templated framework for our quality control. But thank you for the question, Samson. Um, any other, if anybody has any other questions, um, please uh, feel free to uh, pop those in to the, to the questions panel. Um, and again, you can download the slides and it's an exit survey and a recording of this video will be shared with everybody uh, tomorrow by email. And if you'd like to learn more about mnemonic services or ask us some questions about specific regulations, please feel free to, uh, to reach out. So I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. We got uh, the questions. Just a thank you from Cedric. That's always appreciated. Um, thank you to Yura for helping put together the slides and for working on our AI team. Um, and again, don't hesitate to reach out. This is really exciting. We think there's tremendous potential for regulatory analysis and for uh, processing of a lot of data and making everybody's life a little bit easier. So thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a great day. And uh, thank you for, for coming to the webinar today.